Yes, thanks again for everybody joining us. Um, we have today Irfan Vafawi, I hope I said that right, um, who's an extension program specialist for Texas A&M Agriculture, uh, AgriLife Extension in Overton. Uh, his main focus is on integrated pest management of insects in the greenhouse and nursery production. His main area of research includes management of aphids, white flies, thrips, and the invasive crepe myrtle bark scale. Um, Thank you for joining us today, and we really appreciate you uh, being our presenter. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, so, as you know, I think my first name is the only one people really need to remember because there aren't too many air fun entomologists that I know of. And uh, you can think of air, like what you breathe, and, and fawn, like a baby deer. So I'm like an inflatable baby deer. All right, so just think inflatable baby deer, air fawn. And that way, if you need to Google air fawn entomologist, you can find that. If there's one kind of takeaway uh, from, from this talk, and I think everyone who's kind of in this field, in this area, recognizes that, uh, you know, when we're dealing with insects in the landscape, it's basically like dealing with uh, mini aliens. And uh, I'll go on the next slide here. So these mini aliens as an example, you know, I love taking this little uh, piece of a shot of, uh, in this case, is a type of arthropod that has found a landscape and try and get people's guesses as to what it is. And we actually look at the whole organism. This is a type of spider, Microthena gracilis, uh, which can make very large spider webs. It's relatively harmless to humans. Uh, but you can see just the way that it looks in terms of this structure. Uh, it looks very alien-like, but they're very small. We also start looking at some other organisms. So here, as an example, is a lacewing larva that has actually uh, put the carcasses of its enemies on its back. You can see some pieces of waxy scales, see some other pieces of little bark on its back, uh, and it's using this to kind of mask itself, almost like a wolf in sheep's clothing, except the sheep in this case is, you know, other remnants of other insects and dust and debris. So if you see a piece of, of dust or, de or debris kind of crawling around, you're not losing your mind, or you might not, I should say you might not, you might be losing your mind, but it's also possible that it's actually uh, one of these insects that's uh, crawling around. And insects also have very unique types of, uh, you know, life histories, the way they develop. So they have an exoskeleton, right, the skeletons on the outside, so they cannot really just gradually grow. They actually need to cast off that hard exoskeleton, and the inner skeleton is a little bit pliable. It can grow a little bit and then harden again. And again, these are types of features that are very uh, foreign to the human race. These are not things that we uh, inherently have or mammals have, and I would argue are very alien-like. We have some insects as well that look like hybrids of some organisms. So here's a mole cricket. You can see from its forelimbs, uh, looks very much like the forelimbs of a mole that uses for digging in the ground. It can cause very similar damage to moles in turf. You actually get that tunneling, uh, whereas the rest of the body looks like a cricket. And it is actually a predatory insect as well. You can see in the background, it's mauled this caterpillar right here, and then has come to the foreground for a nice fancy little photo. And we also get some more crazy hybrids. Here's one that looks kind of like a, a fly, a mix between a fly and a praying mantis. Uh, but it's actually called a, this one's a mantid fly, you know, praying mantis and a fly, almost like a mix. But it's actually quite different from either of those organisms. It's in its own category and is considered a predator. And we have also within this similar types of uh, categories, we have ant lions. And these insects are very alien-like. They live uh, will we'll typically hunt by going underground and create a bit of a depression in the ground, will hide under there, just like this depression here. One can expect at the bottom of this for there to be an, uh, an antlion. And when an insect kind of crawls around or inside the depression, that larva will start shooting basically pieces of dirt at it to make it fall down into the bottom and it will catch it and pull it down. Not uh, very much unlike Sarlacc from Star Wars that uh, saw the demise of Bubba Fett. And so, you know, these mini aliens are incredibly diverse. You know, the recent estimates of diversity on the planet says that there's probably around 8.7 million eukaryotic organisms that live on the planet. Of those, only 1.2 million have been described. So there are way more species that have been undescribed that we haven't really identified and 
and really understood compared to those that have been described. And of those, about 59% are insects. So it's no wonder that it can be challenging to identify insects correctly. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's really, it's not, it's not your fault if you're misidentifying, all right? Because this is, it's very challenging. Not only is there incredible diversity with these insects, but they also exhibit some behaviors that almost naturally makes it very difficult. It's like they want to make it difficult for you to identify them in what we call mimicry. Anyone with a younger sibling would be very familiar with said mimicry. But the idea in insects or in biological organisms is when one animal is resembling another. And that resemblance can usually be in color, pattern, form, or behavior. And sometimes it will mimic um, as just maybe a part or an aspect of another animal. And there's a few different types of mimicry that we can see in organisms. So one example, uh, example is uh, we have Bayesian, Eulerian, and self-mimicry. We'll kind of go into this, these three types just with quick little examples. So with Batesian, it's when the mimic is, uh, it's basically mimicking, the organism is mimicking something that's less pal palatable. So we have monarch butterflies that the larva will feed on milkweed plants and they'll sequester some of those toxins. So if a bird feeds on that, it's actually taking up some of those toxins and it doesn't really like that. All right, so this is, a, this is an insect that is not considered very palatable. But now we have the viceroy butterfly that it does not necessarily feed on uh, those milkweed plants. There are caterpillars who actually feed on uh, willows and cottonwoods and other plants like that. But the adult form will mimic the monarch butterfly in order to get the added benefits. So now if a bird eats a monarch butterfly and realizes I'm not eating one of those ever again, now the viceroy has that same learned uh, protection as well. So those birds will avoid eating them too. An example of this as well, like in a real life scenario, would be if I wore a, uh, you know, a Harley leather jacket. Uh, outside, you know, and people would maybe think that I'm a part of the uh, Hell's Angels or something like that. If I put a Hell's Angels tag on my back, even though I'm not a part of that gang, people would be less likely uh, to mess with me because that's a problem I face with on a daily basis. No, it's not. All right. Going on to Mullerian. Uh, this is when unpalatable species mimic each other. So uh, examples, you know, when we see this yellow and, and black kind of coloration uh, in honeybees, bumblebees, or wasps, Right? All of them are kind of a, a signal and, and together are saying we are stinging insects. So now if as a, an animal you feed on one of those or you start attacking one, you get stung, you now learn to avoid all of those kind of organisms that have that black and yellow kind of striping. Now you can imagine there's going to be some insects that will take advantage of that, knowing that if they are to develop or to evolve or uh, over time, maybe uh, some organisms will be less likely to eat the, the ones that have some black and yellow stripes. So that is a, a trait that becomes selected for. And then we get this Mullerian uh, mimicry. And we have self-mimicry, where one body part mimics another body part. So as an example, in this spice bush swallowtail caterpillar, you can see the rear end here. This is the rear, almost looks like a head. It looks like a face. And this way, it's like having eyes on the back of your head. You know, if you tell any teachers here, say I have eyes in the back of my head, is so that kids won't cause trouble when, you're, when your back is facing them. In the same way, this caterpillar is essentially uh, has this mimicking trait in order to prevent any predators, say, from uh, considering coming from, from the rear end, where it's actually going to be most vulnerable. So the question ultimately for when it comes to identification, is we want to know, well, which insect is good and which is bad, right? So if I have a particular one, do I need to get rid of it? And oftentimes the good and the bad can look very similar. So identifying them can be a little bit challenging. And so here we're going to go through now just some types of organisms and uh, some of the characteristics that they have in similarity and some of the things that are actually quite different. Now, as an extension person uh, down here in Texas, we often get photos or samples sent to, uh, to us of larvae. So that is the immature life stage of a lot of these insects. So insects, uh, depending on the species of the groupings, can undergo two major different forms of uh, what we call metamorphosis or transitioning from one life stage to the next. So what we have here on the, on the left side, what we call gradual or simple metamorphosis. 
where you have eggs that become nymphs that become adults. In this case here, the nymphs are basically a smaller version of the adult, and they resemble the adult in many ways. Now, the nymphs often don't have wings, uh, and their coloration might be a bit different, but in general, they resemble the adults. Here on the right side, uh, what we consider the most advanced form of metamorphosis is complete metamorphosis, where we get eggs that become larvae. We get different larval stages, so they go through different stages of development, and then they create a pupa. So if you think of like a cocoon or a chrysalis, and a, you know, a, a caterpillar to a butterfly undergoes these similar life stages. They are, they're part of this group that undergoes complete metamorphosis. And then we get the adult. And so the larval stage and the adult form do not resemble each other. They look very different. And so trying to identify a species based on the larval form, uh, you know, can really help, at least if you're seeing a bunch of larvae on your, on your crop or in the landscape and trying to determine what it is and whether you have a lot of the adults around that might be laying eggs, it can be helpful to identify. So here's just a very simple key that can actually get from University of Kentucky uh, that Lee Townsend uh, has a nice little page published, but just kind of going through it, he has this picture key to insect larval types. Now this is a generalization. There are some exceptions and there are some things that don't fall into here, but I'd say for the most part, I think this is a pretty good guide. So you start here at the very top, start. And the first thing you wanna look at is whether that organism has any legs, any visible legs or not, all right? So if it doesn't have legs, we'll get into that uh, in a few slides later. We're gonna assume that your organism does have legs. If it has three pairs of uh, segmented legs on the thorax, we, we continue on over to here, and it has paired fleshy legs present on the abdomen, all right? And we'll see here, so this organism, you can see it has these jointed legs up on the, this is the thorax, or the upper part of the body. There's these fleshy legs on the lower part. And from here, if it has five or fewer pairs of fleshy legs, so here we can count one, two, three, four, five, then it's gonna be a caterpillar, a looper or an inchworm. Typically, the larval stage of some type of a, a butterfly or a moth. So here is an example of an I.O. moth. We can see here what are called the segmented true legs of the thorax. So we don't count these in, in that five uh, pair leg max. The ones we're counting, so here's the head, are these ones closer to the rear. You can see here three, what looks like three pairs of fleshy legs. So this is going to be the larval stage of a type of a caterpillar or a moth. Now, if we go over to this side, we can see if there's five pairs of fleshy legs or more, uh, sorry, if there's more than five, so it's five or more, uh, then these are actually sawflies. And these are the larval stages of wasps of certain types of wasps, I should mention. So you can see this one here. So these are the jointed legs up at the front of the thorax. So these are true legs. Now, if we look at this soft, uh, the, the proto legs, the fleshy legs, you can see that there are seven of them. There's seven pairs for each of these. And so that is not gonna be the larval stage of a uh, caterpillar, uh, sorry, a butterfly or a moth, but rather the larval stage of some type of a wasp. Now continuing on, so if there are no fleshy legs on the abdomen, all right, so now we're getting into two, two different parts. If those legs now on the thorax are long, we consider those to be either lacewing, lady beetle, or ground beetle larva. We can say here, this is a lady beetle larva. Those legs are considered relatively long, and we'll see what the short legs look like. And they need these long legs in order to hunt, right? So in this case, Lady beetle larvae are predators, and they're crawling around looking for something to eat. They had very short legs. It'd be really hard for it to move around and, and find its prey. And here we can see a ground beetle larva. You can also see those legs are rather long. And again, it has no proto legs. It only has legs on the thorax. This is also considered a predator, both in its larval stage and in its adult stage. And that's ground beetles, uh, ground beetle larva. So now, going over to this side, so now no fleshy legs on abdomen, but has short thoracic legs. We're starting to, uh, we're starting to look at things like wire grubs, wire worms, root worms, leaf beetles, and carpet beetles. For the most part, these are considered some kind of an insect pest. They might be feeding on the roots, uh, inside the roots of plants, or actually chewing on the roots of plants. 
uh, and can be considered problematic uh, depending on the population size. So here, as an example, are uh, white grubs, what we'll call them in the family Scarabidae. You can see here are different life stages, and these we consider relatively short legs. And here is an example of a wire worm. You can see those legs are very fun, a living, causing a decay and, and uh, wilt of that plant. So that covers uh, all the larval stages, all the different larvae, I should say, that have some type of legs. Now, if we start looking at the ones that don't have segmented legs in the thorax, we go to section two. So here we are. Now there's basically two separate groups. Either it has a distinct head, which could be a weevil grub, a midge, mosquito, drainfly, fungus gnat, or soldier fly, or it does not really have a distinct head or is kind of hidden. That's like crane flies, rat-tailed maggot, flat-headed boar, round-headed boar, maggot, and aphid predators. So you can see here as an example, this one here has a relatively dark and distinct head. This is the larval stage of a dark-winged fungus gnat larva. So these are these fungus gnat larvae will actually, uh, especially in the absence of other organic matter, can start chewing on the roots of uh, young plants. And here we can see this is a weevil larva. And that weevil larva looks a lot like that white grub, except it doesn't have any of those legs on the thorax. And it has a distinct head. Now, if we go over to this side, we're looking at things that do not really have a distinct head. Uh, one example here is just housefly larva. You can see here, we don't really see that head uh, as being very distinct. And this is the pupa of those uh, houseflies right there. Here as well, we can see this is the crane fly larva. Again, you don't really see a distinct head. This is actually the posterior. This is the anterior where the head is. We don't see a, a kind of a distinct head there. And just a note on crane flies, you know, sometimes those are those, uh, they look like very large mosquitoes, or mosquitoes are very long legs. All right, they're sometimes referred to as mosquito hawks, uh, but uh, that's actually uh, a little bit incorrect or misidentification. These crane flies will, are not predators of mosquitoes. Uh, so they're, in, in that sense, not going to be considered necessarily all that beneficial. So if you have them flying in your house, um, get them out. <laughs> so now the challenge is, with a lot of these, they, they become adult forms, right? And in this case, we can see uh, this is actually a moth that uh, appears to be mimicking a lot of the behavior of hummingbirds, right? sometimes known as a hawk moth or a sphinx moth. They will actually hover uh, just above the plant and feed on it rather than landing on the plant. And their wing beats will be so fast, if you actually saw it, the frame rates of my camera are a little too slow here, but it, it actually looks like it's flying uh, with its wings as fast as a hummingbird. So many mazes is mimicking. And uh, you know, we look at things like this and why it's important to identify the larval stage then to the adult, because in general, we would consider this a beautiful uh, moth. Uh, and we would consider it something that's beneficial and a pollinator that we want to stick around. But if you recognize its larval stage, is this is a hornworm. All right, so hornworms become sphinx moths, and uh, hornworms are often uh, considered the bane of our existence in gardens because they will eat all of the things. And so, you know, if you're in a home garden or in a landscape where they are not causing devastating damage, even though this is a correct identification, it's a hornworm. Uh, we may not recognize that they will become uh, beautiful adults, and so they are maybe something that. You know, if, if the damage can be tolerated, we may consider uh, keeping. In a similar case here, uh, where we actually have um, a, a fertility, uh, fertility moth a caterpillar, and you can see here from the spines, it looks quite mean. It looks dangerous that one would assume that it is a, uh, a pest or something to get rid of. But again, it is something that is considered uh, to be quite beautiful as in its adult form. So this is the the adult of that freaky mean looking caterpillar from the last slide, the Gulf Fertillery. Now going on to things that look like wasps. All right, so, uh, you know, we have, so in this case, for example, this may be confused for a certain type of uh, wasp, but it's actually a type of a clear wing moth. So this is actually a grouping of moth in the family Ciciidae. And uh, many species are considered important wood boring pests. So if you're to misidentify it, you, you might think that it's a nuisance pest or something not to bother. 
uh, but it might actually be causing damage in some wood boring trees. So uh, that is something that can often be misidentified. And you'll notice here on the, on the posterior end, something that's rather distinct as compared to um, a, a wasp. And moths will have scales, all right? So these, uh, whereas wasps will kind of have more, if anything, they have hair, uh, but they won't have uh, scales like this one here. This one too will often be identified as some kind of a yellow jacket wasp, right? So immediately people will think we've got to get rid of it. And they're absolutely right. This is a yellow jacket. This is a very, very angry wasp. That's not an incorrect identification. You want to get rid of this one. <laughs> you don't necessarily want to get rid of it, but I would not recommend angering it in any way. However, there are some mimics of yellow jackets. So this would be an example of that Batesian mimicry. We have a moth here, the American hornet moth or poplar clearwing borer. So as you can imagine from the name, as it suggests, it is a, a borer. The larval stages can cause damage in poplar trees, uh, but they're not gonna sting you. You don't have to worry about their aggressiveness. And when you take a closer look, you can actually see even though their wing, their, sorry, their coloration pattern looks like a yellow jacket, uh, they, they have some distinct features that are quite different from, uh, from a wasp. We also have a number of waxy uh, insects. So for example, mealybugs. Mealybugs are a type of sucking insect pest. And what they're doing is basically sucking that, uh, insect, that, that sap out of the plant and they wanna extract the nitrogen. Because with that nitrogen, they can make more protein. With those proteins, they can make more babies. So they're baby making machines. Now in that process of, of extracting that sap, they are creating a lot of waste sap, right? They don't need all that sugary solution. So they excrete it in what we call honeydew. So if you ever see a kind of a sticky, shiny surface on your plants or in the landscape, and it's not due to morning dew or recent irrigation, there's a good chance you might have some kind of a sucking pest nearby that is causing the production of this honeydew. And so mealybugs, as an example, can produce honeydew. Here's another example now of a different species of mealybug. This one is the pink hibiscus mealybug. And you can see quite different from this one here where they looked very distinct and there's just a bit of wax on top of the individuals. In this case, it looks like a thick mat of wax. When we get closer, you can see that wax is both on and off of the mealybugs and creates kind of a waxy mess. And so, you know, sometimes this can be confused for some type of a scale insect, which even though uh, mealybugs and scales are kind of in the similar group, they're, they're going to be a little bit different in terms of management strategy. Now, here's an example of a soft or a felt scale. This one's actually the crepe myrtle bark scale. It's a relatively new invasive on crepe myrtles. And you can see that uh, all that, those, those white things are actually uh, either egg sacs, so large egg sacs, or their male pupa. The immatures are actually very hard to see with the naked eye. Typically, you'd need a, either a good hand lens or a microscope uh, to see the immatures kind of crawling around on, on that tree branch. When we get closer, you can see some of the immatures here. There's one, there's another. Here's an adult male. And we can start to see this black mold growing on top of this white stuff. We call that sooty mold. All right, when you get a lot of sucking insect pests, they're creating that honeydew that creates a, a perfect kind of uh, nutrient medium for this, this mixture of molds that we call sooty mold, because it resembles soot, essentially, sitting on the surface. And that soot can grow on leaves or on branches, on bark, or anything that that honeydew is basically resting on. That soot in itself won't necessarily kill the plant directly, but if it's on that leaf surface, it can reduce the leaf's uh, you know, ability to absorb the rays of the sun, so it can reduce that plant's growth. So in that sense, it's considered uh, you know, potentially reducing the yields of the plant, but also aesthetically displeasing as well. So those are insects. You know, you're going to get that, that honeydew and uh, subsequent sooty mold as a result of insects that produce honeydew. Now we have some scale insects, such as the false oleander scale, that also looks quite waxy, but is actually considered a hard or an armored scale. Now the difference between a hard or an armored scale and a soft scale, so that's the soft, the soft scale is the one that we saw just a bit earlier there, the equipment of bark scale, is that the armored scales will not produce honeydew. So if you don't see any honeydew production, you see an infestation, but no honeydew production or no sooty mold, you know you're dealing with some kind of armored or hard scale. 
And again, the reason why that's important is because if you're now deciding, you know, you have to do something to manage that pest on the plant. All right. Now in the landscape, typically a lot of these scale insects won't be considered detrimental. There are some that, that can be like the cycad polycaspis scale. But uh, if, if you've decided you need to treat, some insecticide labels will say hard or armored scale, whereas they won't say felt scale and vice versa. So being able to identify the type of scale that you have is going to help you make the correct uh, treatment decision. Here again, wax on the stem, just this behavior. Oh, I hope everyone can still see okay. Uh, you'll notice that these organisms are kind of moving from the left and to the right, all right? And these are, uh, it is a very distinct behavior. You're not going to get this in mealybugs. You're not going to get this in the scale insects. The scale insects, the adults are not really going to move at all. In mealybugs, you might get some movement. Whereas here, in this case, we're dealing with a citrus-flatted plant hopper nymphs. And only the nymphs really make this wax. The adults don't. And so the adults can look quite different from the nymphs as a result of this. And you'll notice that they're very shy. They're moving on the opposite side of the plant. So if we look at uh, some other similarly related organisms, I really like looking at glassy winged sharpshooters. These are also, you'll see right here on the stem of the plant. And you can see them actually shooting the honeydew off of them. If you look very closely, those droplets coming off of them is their honeydew. That's, that's that excrement I was referring to. And you'll see they're very shy, just like that plant hopper. And so this is a very similar type of behavior between these organisms that they are basically essentially very shy. You can see, uh, you know, this video goes on for about five minutes of me having a lot of fun uh, just making these sharpshooters go on the opposite end of the stem. But so if they're doing that behavior, you, you know that you have uh, some type of a plant hopper or sharpshooter. Now in this case, you'll notice it looks a lot like a mealybug, but it's moving rather quickly. This, you could argue, is, you know, it's hunting. It's, it's uh, looking for some kind of prey. Uh, and this is actually the larval stage of a lady beetle. This is actually a type of lady, people will call them lady bugs, and actually technically beetles. It's a larval stage of a lady beetle that mimics mealybugs, presumably to avoid defenses from ants, or to also, again, it's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Here we can see this one is actually a type of aphid. So you'll notice there's a lot of different types of waxy insects that aren't just scale insects. And this is the hackberry woolly aphid. Uh, just a few summer, summers ago here in Texas, it felt like it was snowing in the middle of the summer because uh, there's just little pieces of like cotton basically just floating around. Uh, and there's these hackberry woolly aphids were kind of all over. And you can see here as a closer shot, you can see uh, the distinct proboscis. This is the feeding mouth part coming right out of the bottom here. Uh, that can kind of help, at least if you, if you can see that, if it's kind of elevated up, and you can see that proboscis, and they are going to move quite a bit more than, say, a scale insect and a mealybug, and they, especially if they're winged, they will take flight. Uh, there's a good chance that you have uh, some kind of a woolly aphid. We also have um, a woolly adalgid, uh, and if you were to look up uh, hemlock, uh, waxy insect. There's a good chance this will be the first insect because it's causing a lot of devastation to a lot of the hemlock uh, kind of in the eastern U.S. Uh, so it's been a huge problematic insect which can actually cause decline of the plant. So now we're going on to a little bit more of honeybee-like insects. So you know here's an insect that uh, is the honeybee, Apis mellifera. And this one here now looks a lot like honeybee, but is actually not. This is actually a surfer fly or a hover fly. Uh, as an adult, they're typically just feeding on nectar or pollen, um, and they don't have any stinging parts, so you don't have to worry about being stung by one of these. Uh, however, they have the benefit uh, that in their larval stage, you can see here, it almost looks like a piece of bird dropping. Um, it's actually a larva. And uh, they will uh, hunt around, so the adults will lay the eggs typically around some kind of aphids or some kind of soft-bited insect. And that will come this larva that uh, will kind of crawl around until it feels an aphid and grab it. And you can see this aphid has been pretty much deflated. So it's basically sucking that aphid dry. So in the larval form, these surfed flies are considered uh, beneficial. They're considered pred uh, predators. We also have this as a bee killer or a robber fly. Um, in, in this uh, genus Melophora. And you can see here, again, it looks a lot like a bee, almost like a bumblebee. 
but is actually a type of a fly that is considered a predator of, um, of honeybees, uh, oftentimes, and other bees as well. In some areas uh, of the world, this can actually be considered quite a, a major pest of apiaries because they will fly around and catch honeybees out of the air and feed on them. Uh, so they can be a bit of a problem, even though they look like uh, a pollinator that one would want to uh, have around. And we also have a, a bee fly. So again, this uh, is a fly instead of a bee, and it has a mouth part that it uses to feed on uh, that nectar and pollen. And their larval stages are considered uh, parasitic. So the larval stages will actually kill other organisms. Uh, so they are also considered beneficial in their larval form. So now we're going on to kind of like the leaf-footed bugs, right? So here are some leaf-footed bu bugs that, again, they have this, um, this proboscis, this feeding mouth part that penetrates, uh, you know, leaves, stems, and especially problematic when it starts penetrating leaf buds, flowers, and fruit, where it can actually cause uh, bruising or that uh, deformation and things like that. And so we have some, uh, several species of leaf-footed bugs, right? It's not just one species, and they all belong in this a genus called Leptoglossus. So here are just some examples, Leptoglossus anatus, Occidentalis, and Clipialis uh, right here. And we start looking at the immature stages is where we can start getting um, a little bit more cryptic. Uh, you can start getting a little bit more misidentified. So here is a Leptoglossus species, and you can see the larval stage looks quite a bit different from the adult. Uh, it is red and has kind of these spines on its body, and you can see that proboscis uh, that is actually penetrating the leaf. So if you see an insect where its proboscis is penetrating a leaf, there's a good chance that it's still considered some variant of a pest, although you might not know the species down to the species level. But here you can see one that is also red and looks quite similar, but it has this proboscis inside a fly. And this is actually uh, the nymph of an, uh, some type of an assassin bug. And so they have a slightly thicker proboscis typically, and is usually a little bit more curved rather than neatly tucked under the body. And again, they're gonna be considered predators. So if you see uh, something like this, that its proboscis is not in the plant, and rather is perhaps hunting around or has an insect in its proboscis, that'd be considered some kind of a beneficial insect such as an assassin bug. We also get now, you know, for people, a lot of people now are growing milkweeds because they're trying to encourage monarch butterfly populations, which is, which is great. And uh, here we have a milkweed bug, which is considered a, a pest of milkweeds. And you can see, again, it has that similar coloration of that kind of red and black. And you can see the adults here looking a little bit different from the nymphs, but these adults should not be confused. Again, so it can anything that you see that's kind of red and black and looks like this on a milkweed plant isn't necessarily the milkweed bug. Because here's an example, we have the milkweed assassin bug. And this is considered, again, a predatory insect and beneficial as it will feed on other soft-bodied insects. So here again is that milkweed assassin bug is a side profile. And you can see that proboscis is a little bit more curved, whereas with prey, it'll usually be a little bit more flat against its body. So that's, that's a sign uh, can be used as a general characteristic to kind of help you identify the difference between a predator and a prey item. And here you can see, so this one looks a lot like an ant. It's actually an ant mimic. So here you can see it's called a broad-headed uh, bug in this family, Alatidae. And uh, these insects here are quite interesting. This is actually the nymphal, uh, nymph form. And the nymphs will feed during the day and the night near ants. And uh, the ants won't actually attack them or anything like that. Whereas uh, in the adult form, they will kind of avoid. So in the adult form, these insects don't look a whole lot like ants and are gonna be a little bit more nocturnal and avoid feeding at the same time of ants. So there's been some, some work demonstrating that, uh, you know, this, this feature of looking like an ant kind of protects them from the defenses uh, from, of, of ants. Now we're getting on to small flies, right? So there's a whole lot of small fly things that all look quite similar. And this can be quite difficult unless you can recognize certain key features and perhaps uh, understand what, what types of symptoms you're getting on the plant and whether it can match uh, those types of insects. So dark-winged fungus gnats or fungus gnats in general, typically the ones that are actually problematic are the dark-winged dark fungus gnats in the um, genus Bradesia. 
And they typically has very long legs for their body. All right, so if you have a very small fly and the legs are large in proportion to the body and you're getting some symptoms on, on your plant that is, uh, you know, for example, you know, you have good watering in the plant, you know, the soil is moist, uh, you don't see any damage above, but the, the plant is wilting, you may have uh, an issue with fungus gnats actually feeding on those roots. So here's what the larvae look like. And if you remember, they have a distinct head. Uh, and so they are uh, that fungus that can, that can help in the larval stage if you see that distinct uh, head and a helping identifying feature to, to narrow down that it might be fungus gnats. We also get white flies that are small little flies and they almost resemble like tiny little white moths. All right, and so these insects, um, you know, they're typically gonna be on a plant, uh, actual leaf uh, and feeding on that leaf. And you can see here the proboscis, again, that feeding mouth part that's penetrating the leaf and feeding on it. And if you disturb them, they will kind of do a quick little flight, usually land back on a, uh, either on that same leaf or on a plant nearby. So they won't make uh, large flights, but they are a tiny, uh, small, a white flying insect. All right, and here's an example from a top-down view that if you have a white fly infestation, you will see these different stages typically as well. So these uh, white empty things are what we call exuvia. So after they've kind of gone in their pupa, metamorphosed, become an adult, and they come out, that's kind of like the leftover shell. And here we can see several pupa. So these are actually pupa. They're uh, going from that um, immature stage to adult form. And here's actually an older uh, immature stage, an older nymph. And uh, you can see they look quite, they're usually quite flat. And to the naked eye, it just looks like a bit of discoloration on the leaf. Uh, unless you use a kind of like a hand lens or, uh, or, or a microscope, um, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky, unless you already know how to identify them. It can be a little bit tricky to identify uh, in their nymph stage. And we also get small flies, like just fruit flies in the house, right? So uh, fruit flies are, in general, uh, not considered very problematic. However, there are some fruit flies that are, and I'm sure anyone who's in a region that has had uh, major issues uh, with spotted wing Drosophila, this is a, a small little fruit fly and it gets its name spotted wing for those spots on the wings. It's like a, a tiny little fruit fly and all, this is only on the males. They have that one spot on the terminal end of that second uh, wing vein. So you can see this is the first wing vein here, this is the second one here, and that spot is on the tip of each of their wings. And why this one's problematic, perhaps in the landscape, especially if you have any soft-bodied fruit in there that you're, you're actually trying to harvest and, and keep, is that the female, you know, this is the female ovipositor. This is the organ that she uses to lay eggs. And you can see it's serrated like a little saw. So she will actually saw into any soft-bodied fruit just before it's ripe and lay eggs in it. So by the time you harvest, it's full of fruit fly, fruit fly larva. So this is quite distinct and different from a lot of our other native fruit flies here uh, because the females do not have a serrated ovipositor. So they need to wait for that fruit to have already cracked open or for that skin to already be somehow penetrated for them to lay eggs inside. Whereas this fruit fly was introduced through California into the continental uh, US and into, into North America in 2008 and has since uh, kind of spread, I'd say, pretty much throughout all of uh, North America. Within this small fly group, we also have parasitic wasps. So these are very small wasps. You can see here the scale, that's one millimeter. So length is maybe no more than two or three millimeters in length. And these wasps are considered beneficial. So you don't want to confuse, say, the spotted wing Drosophila for your parasitic wasps. And your parasitic wasps, how they're helping, is that it's basically like the movie Alien. I mean, I said basically, you know, we're dealing with mini aliens here. These wasps, so this is an example of one prey on unicum that uh, I, I worked on during my graduate studies. And she lays her eggs inside um, an, an aphid. So you can see here, this aphid doesn't know what's going on. Boom, gets an egg laid inside. That egg develops into a larva and feeds on the insides of that larva until nothing is left but the carcass of that aphid. And then it'll form this little pupa under that aphid, metamorphose into a new wasp and emerge out. This stage, this life state right here, when you see this uh, funny color here of this aphid, we call this an aphid mummy. 
All right, so if you look at a patch of aphids, and they all look very similar, except for a few that look kind of bulged up, they could be bronze or gold or black or brown. Uh, there's a good chance you have some parasitic wasps that are working on that group of aphids. So you don't necessarily want to spray or disrupt that. You know, maybe just crush maybe the other aphids that are not mummies uh, and then maintain those other aphids. Because each of those wasps, you know, depending on the species, can lay between 100 to 300 eggs in their lifetime. So they, they can lay several uh, eggs and, and kill many aphids uh, as a result. Ah, uh, yes, I love these. So these are, you know, we saw, we saw them earlier. This is a lady beetle larva, right? It looks very different from the beetle itself. And as a result, people can kind of confuse them as potentially being some kind of a pest. But they are uh, predators. You can see right now it's crawling around hunting, uh, looking for some crepe myrtle bark scale actually to eat in this case. And many times, this is uh, actually their pupa, and many times people will confuse their pupa for something else, maybe some type of a scale insect or some type of a pest, especially because they're oftentimes in these clusters. And you can see here, this is actually the adult form of these pupa. This is what we commonly refer to as a twice-stabbed lady beetle because it's black and it has these two red dots on it, like as if it was stabbed twice. And again, these pupa, even after they emerge as adults, the exuvia, again, the cast off skin, can stay on there for quite a while. Uh, in some cases, I've seen well over a year. Uh, and so, you know, it might just, you know, if you see something like this, it might just be remnants of uh, lady beetle pupa rather than fresh pupa. This is a closer look here at that pupa. What's kind of fun is actually during certain life stages of this, this pupa, as it's metamorphosing, if you disturb it, even though it's just a gobbledygook of soup cells in there that are metamorphosing into a new organism, essentially from the larval to the adult stage, you disturb it, it'll kind of kick itself up like this. And it's kind of thought to be a bit of a defense mechanism, right? So if some kind of a, a wasp is trying to lay an egg in there or some kind of a bird or something is trying to attack it, it can kind of quickly kind of shake itself uh, to, to ward off that uh, potential predator. So here's for your viewing pleasure, those lady beetles actually, you know, eating aphids, you know, they, they look like uh, from the outside, when you, when you see these lady beetles, they look like cute little beetles, uh, but they're actually very ferocious and uh, aphids fear these things in their lives. Uh, and they can eat, you know, this is the multicolor Asian lady beetle. It's, it's technically an invasive. This is the one that you will see invading your home every fall time as they're seeking shelter. Uh, but these are the ones that will, uh, are very voracious on the landscape as well and will eat a lot of aphids. So if you can encourage their populations, right? We don't necessarily, I don't know if, you know, I think we spoke about this in my last, last webinar, was that uh, I don't know of any cases where releasing them, buying them and releasing them in mass, large quantities works. But if you can encourage their populations by being careful with what you spray and maybe uh, adding some plants that, that would provide them with some alternate resources or habitat, then you can encourage them and, and they can help keep some of your pests in check. And lastly, or I think this is lastly, uh, Cicoptera. All right, so this, oftentimes I get this question about what, what are these, and, you know, or I sprayed them and I killed them all, was that bad? Well, these aren't bad insects, all right? So Cicoptera, sometimes known as bark lice or tree cattle. And the way you can know if you're dealing with tree cattle is because, as the name suggests, they act like cattle on the tree. I love it. If you see a cluster of them, disturb them, right? They're, they're always gonna be in these clusters. And this is me just being a goofball during one of my days at work, disturbing some tree cattle. And you'll notice them running, kind of like in a herd. So they're a lot of fun to disturb. And you can see they all just start following each other in a row. And, and sometimes they'll branch off and circle back. Uh, so they're a lot of fun to disturb. And they, they just basically feed on uh, de detritus matter, stuff that's kind of already breaking down. Uh, they can feed on lichen. So you can see here there was some lichen on that tree that they could have been feeding on. But they won't necessarily attack or damage the tree directly. So they're actually helping, they're decomposers to help them break down some of that matter on the tree. Uh, that wasn't the last one. There's more. Uh, lacewing. Uh, eggs. So oftentimes, you know, I remember the first time I saw something like this. It was actually on a small immature apple when I was working on an organic farm, Clippers Organic Acres out in the West Coast. And, um, you know, I had a bunch of these on there. And I remember thinking it was something about a fungus, but it's actually the eggs of an insect. You can see all these eggs laid singly on these threads. 
And one hypothesis is that uh, because these, these larvae, when they come out, will actually uh, cannibalize. They will eat those other eggs. And so by putting on the single threads, uh, you're actually creating a lot of distance between these larvae without having to fly a far distance to lay each one of your individual eggs. So now when this larva comes out, comes all the way down this, this tiny little thin thread, it may consider going on this thicker stem for some uh, prey instead of climbing up these other threads to try and kill uh, its siblings. And so here's another uh, photo. You can sometimes see just a single one. Sometimes they're not in clusters. Sometimes it is just a single one on a plant leaf. Uh, and here's what the adult looks like. So if you leave your uh, lights on, your board, them, they are nocturnal and uh, relatively small. This image makes it look a lot bigger. Uh, but their larval form are, so as adults, typically they're just feeding on nectar and pollen. Some of them can be predators, uh, whereas in their larval form, they're mostly always predators. So you can see here, this uh, larva has, has used its mandibles to penetrate uh, this aphid and is basically uh, digesting it and sucking it dry. Uh, so it is considered, <laughs> aphids are the victim of the day. Uh, it is considered a, a, a beneficial insect for that reason. And uh, lastly, I just want to touch on this one. Uh, that a, a colleague, uh, Susan Wainwright, or uh, Bug Lady, as she's refers to herself, has uh, kind of brought to my attention several times that it looks like a house fly. All right, this one here in the back looks like a house fly. It was actually called a hunter fly, which was introduced or first seen in Florida in the early 2000s, uh, oftentimes in greenhouses. Because uh, they are actually, uh, they will sit on these perches, they'll perch up on little strings, ropes, or on whatever uh, up above and, and look for flying, small flying insects and catch them midair and uh, feed on them. And they can be a little bit non-discriminate, so they can feed on parasitic wasps, but they can also feed on fungus gnat adults and white flies and things like that uh, as well. So they can be confused for just a common house fly, especially in a greenhouse setting, you might think it's a house fly, but if it's perched up and or it's eating other insects, uh, there's a good chance that what you're dealing with is some type of a hunter fly or synosia. And that, concludes uh, some, of the, some of the commonly misidentified pests in the landscape. And at this time, uh, I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was really informative. And um, do we have any questions that haven't been asked and answered already? I know the chat box, Vicki and Tim did a great job um, of fielding a lot of questions as we went along, but does anybody else have anything they would like to, to ask? And Danny is going to put up some poll questions real quick. And uh, before everybody logs out, we hope you'll take a moment to take those poll questions. Oh, here's what it looks like. <laughs> Those are really great photos. I oh, really thank you. enjoyed all the pictures. Yeah, yeah, there are some, I highly encourage on uh, Flickr and on Bugwood, there are some uh, excellent photos. And as you know, Bugwood uh, photos can be used for non-commercial use as long as they're cited. And uh, Flickr has the option of searching uh, for photos that could be used as well, um, you know, for non-commercial use as well. And there are some incredible photographers on there. Yeah. Uh, no. Very cool. Mallory, there was a question in, in the Q&A box. Brent asked, is there any continuation for the life cycle of the lady beetle after it gets inside a house during the fall or is that the end of the life? Uh, for the multicolor Asian lady beetle, uh, you know, that's, that's a good question actually. Do y'all, do y'all know off the top of your head if you know, from my understanding, that's kind of their overwintering, and then they will they will go back outside as a part of their life cycle. But I may be mistaken. Airfin, this is Tim Davis. Uh, yeah. That that's correct. They, after um, they're in your home, when it warms up, they're going to go outside again, and and they'll lay eggs and continue the life cycle. Um, sometimes they don't know whether they're going in or out. They're just going away from where they were. So we usually see infestations in the homes in the fall when they're getting ready to overwinter. And then it's usually a smaller infestation in the spring when they're trying to get out of that hibernation place. 
Thank you, Tim. Um, for the inside of the home, the best spray, would y'all say bifenthrin around windows, cracks and crevices outside and inside, or do y'all recommend anything else? Normally we don't recommend a lot of insecticides with it um, because they're strong flyers um, and they're just a the little tiny tips of their feet they're touching anyway. So, you know, if you've got a huge infestation like on the outside of the house, we, you can do some insecticides on the outside there, but mostly it's just vacuum them up and then remove, remove the vacuum bag uh, and destroy them or take them back outside to your neighbor's house or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, let them go or put the bag in the freezer or burn it or something like that. But, uh, and then caulk does a good job because they're, they're looking for cracks and crevices. So if you do a lot of caulking and sealing, that'll, that'll help uh, keep them from invading the home. Yeah, I have a little uh, handheld vacuum that sucks them up into a little container. When I have them in there right away, I stick that in the freezer. Uh, you know, when I remember next to take it out, uh, then you can just discard them from there. But if you let them sit in there, then that can be a, a problem. So if any of you ladies marry an entomologist, that's what you're going to deal with is there's going to be bugs in the freezer. Just to... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I just know they drive me crazy at my house. And um, if I don't spray something, they continue to just fly around and hit you in the night and still being drawn to the, the lamp you turn on at night. And, oh, they're just so annoying. So... Yeah. They're what we normally refer. Yeah, they're normally something we would refer to as an incidental pest, and and they're, it's more of an aggravation than anything. Mm -hmm. um, I have run into some cases where a bunch of them died in between the walls during the winter, and the and the odor can be bad uh, yeah. as those decay, uh, and then you get secondary pests that come in to prey on on those dead carcasses. But uh, that's that's kind of a rare thing. Here's a great one. This comes from Cheryl, and this says, this is not a question, but this has to be the most informative webinar that I've ever seen. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And let's see, then we have one from Kathy that says uh, there are huge problems with ants. She does not say what kind of ants, but with ants coming into the house, any suggestions? Where are you located? Yeah, I think knowing where they're located would help. And, and, and Tim was mentioning to me earlier that he specializes in ants. So that, uh, <laughs> I'll let Tim take that one too. Really, really for ants, you know, it really does come down to identifications. And so, you know, my first recommendation for, for any kind of pest management is to get an identification. So you can always take these things your current extension office and if they can't identify them there uh, they will send them to specialists on campus uh, or people like me who do a lot of anti-identification will get those and then once we know what it is that's going to determine what kind of treatment we, we recommend for the for the various ants uh, but the identification is most you know the most important thing because that's going to tell us you know if it's a carpenter ant that's going to tell me where to look what to use if it's Argentina ants, which we're going to talk about next week or, or next month, uh, you know, that's going to change uh, the kind of treatment that we do. So identification is going to be the biggest, most important thing. And getting it to, your, to, to an extension office is probably the best way to, to get a, a correct or valid identification. Even most pest control companies don't do a real good job of that. They just kind of assume it's a small red ant. It must be an Argentine or something like that. Thank you for answering those because there were two or three about ants coming into the house or in mulch outside. Yeah, get them identified first and then, and then you can start looking at what kind of management regime you would have. Just to give you an idea, you know, Florida has about 195, I think, species on their list. Uh, South Carolina, I had 125 species that I had collected and I've, I'm guessing there's probably closer to that. 190, 200 species uh, in South Carolina. Um, you know, lots and lots more variety of ants than you, than you, than you, is obvious. And really, only 20 or 30 of those are would be pests. Just to let you know. 
Anybody else have questions today? I see that someone has raised their hand, but if you could tap your question into the Q&A box or the chat box. And don't forget to join us next month while we um, wait for any other questions for the Argentine Ants and Others by Dr. Eric Benson from Clemson University, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, uh, April the 6th. Anybody have anything else? We'll see y'all next month. And thank you, thank you for, for presenting for us today. Those pictures and Absolutely. The were awesome. Great. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy Friday.